thank you so much, Daniel, for that introduction. I'm really pleased to be chairing this panel today on redefining whiteness in the American slasher. And um, as with the other panels so far today, uh, we will hear from each of our presenters in turn. You are all very welcome to post questions and comments in the in the chat section on YouTube. And I'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the papers and picking out questions um, that we can respond to in the Q&A at the end. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Kaylee Simmons holds a PhD in English from the University of California, Riverside, and she is an assistant professor of Indigenous Nations Studies at Portland State University. An Indigenous feminist scholar of Oglala Dakota descent, her work examines depictions of North American native peoples in film and literature with an emphasis on the genres of horror and speculative fiction. Her research has appeared in the Journal of Cinema and Media Studies, and she has an essay on horror and indigenous representation forthcoming in the journal Science Fiction Film and Television. And she's here to speak to us about The Ones Who Did Not Die, Captivity, Narratives and Final Girls. Take it away. Thank you. All right, let me get my screen shared and then we'll get it going. Okay, um, so before I start, there's nothing on the screen, so I'm just going to talk. <laughs> so before I begin, um, I'm speaking to you from the United States, which is a settler state. Um, so I want to acknowledge specifically that I'm speaking to you, to, to you from the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Multnomah Califlimate, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Watlala bands of the Chinook, and also the Tualatin Kalapuya, who among with many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River, are the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air. And so I ask that you, all of you, please take a moment to acknowledge and reflect on the native Aboriginal and indigenous peoples of the area from where you are physically joining us today. And if you're not familiar, um, please take the time to self-educate, to reflect, to listen to these histories of these indigenous peoples as these small acts are part of the justice-oriented advocacy necessary to, for continuing the work of dismantling the devastating effects of settler colonialism in our societies today and in our various nations. So with that, um, I'll jump into the presentation. So according to Carol Clover, Horror's final girl challenges the gendered conventions of cinema because, quote, the gaze becomes, at least for a while, female, end quote. The final girl's apprehension of the gaze does not lead to her punishment, but is actually an essential step leading to her victory over the monster. The repeated representation of a heroic female lead who outlasts her male peers for Cloverwood, quote, seem to suggest at least one of the traditional marks of heroism, triumphant self-rescue, is no longer strictly gendered masculine, end quote. And as such, the figure of the final girl marks a notable departure for Clover from conventional representations of women in cinema and literature. But a look into literary history reveals that slasher films are not the first genre to invite male audience members to identify with the suffering and experiences of a female protagonist. The Puritan woman of the captivity narrative is also able to function as a witness subject who can attest to her own experiences of suffering and survival amongst indigenous peoples. Thus, in the captivity narrative and in the slasher, there is what Clover calls a, quote, exposed invitation, end quote, for a male reader to identify with and center the female protagonist's experiences. And so in this talk, I place two representations of suffering women in productive friction in order to expose the fault lines within American settler colonialism's racial and gendered schemas. I bring the titular character of Mary Rowlandson from a narrative of the captivity and the restoration of Miss Mary Rowlandson, also known as the sovereignty and goodness of God, in conversation with critical readings of popular final girl characters like Laurie Strode, in order to argue that there is a troubling resonance between both archetypes. In both genres, the figure of the suffering white woman is afforded a partial, generic, unmarked, and therefore universal form of subjectivity through the acquisition of a distinctly colonial knowing gaze which justifies violence against people seen as inhuman or abject. In the slasher, the final girl uses her knowledge of the killer to defeat them 
And in the captivity narrative, it is indigenous peoples who must be eliminated. While Final Girl characters have been lauded for the ways that they destabilize Western gender and subject object binaries by enabling women, and notably mostly white women, to temporarily inhabit forms of heroic agential subjectivity, which are usually reserved for white men. But the horror associated with possible acts of trespass committed by or upon the figures of the final girl and the woman in captivity shows that these figures continue to serve key boundary making functions within the colonial imaginary. So let's start with Mary Rowlandson. <laughs> So a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mary Rowlandson is the first and most famous captivity narrative in American literary history. In the text, Rowlandson recalls the 11 weeks and five days she spent as a captive of the Nipmuc, Wampanoag, Narragansett, and Poconocet peoples, who at the time had allied together against Puritan colonists in the midst of King Philip's war. The text consists of two parts. Um, first, there is a brief introduction to Rowlandson and her text offered by Herr Amicum, which translates to by a friend, but which most scholars of Rowlandson agree was most likely penned by Reverend Increase Mather, a member of the Puritan clergy, um, and also notable for his participation in the Salem witch trials. Following Per Amicum's introduction is the body of Rowlandson's text, which is broken up into 20 parts, which are called removes um, in reference to Rowlandson's movement further into indigenous territories throughout the narrative. So scholars continue to debate the ways the text might have been mediated by the men in Rowlandson's life, specifically the degree to which Increase Mather shaped the story's final form. And this is like a whole other can of worms that I'm glad to talk about in Q&A some more. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that question in, in, up in the air for now. Um, although, you know, it is immediately apparent that the preface itself largely functions as a way for the text audience, which at its initial publication would have been primarily men, um, to make sense of the narrative and its author. So to give a little bit of background too about Puritans and how weird they are, <laughs> um, Per Amicum's preface is a performance of what is called Puritan typology, which is a mode of interpreting scripture and all of history. Um, it's a way of reading the world, basically. So typology was premised on the assumption that all instances of providence um, in the present, so instances of miracles or good things that happened to you, were or bad things even, um, were reoccurrences of events of the Bible. So not only was typology a way for Puritans to understand that the New Testament was repetitions of things that was foretold in the Old Testament, but it also allowed them to interpret all of the events of their everyday lives as repetitions of biblical precedents. Um, Increase Mather, aka Per Amicum, would at times go so far as to describe the settlement of the New England colonies as the literal recreation of paradise on earth as foretold in scripture. Uh, so we see this kind of typological reading appearing throughout Per Amicum's preface to Rowlandson's text. For example, he states that Rowlandson's experiences, quote, doth bear some resemblance to those of Joseph, David, and Daniel, yea, and all of the three children too, the stories whereof do represent us with the excellent textures of divine providence. And thus what he's implying is that Rowlandson's narrative is a repetition of the biblical experiences of the prophets. The resonances between Rowlandson's experiences and the biblical precedents thus requires that they be shared publicly. And Per Amicum even goes so far as to describe the narrative as quote, a dispensation of public note and of universal concernment worthy to be exhibited to and pondered by all. However, I want to pause here. I'm sort of obsessed with um, this word uh, dispensation that appears all over um, Per Amicum's preface um, because it has this really sort of, it's a really weighted word with all these contradictory meanings that I think are the interest, my interest in them will become apparent as I proceed. Um, so theologically, the word dispensation refer, refers to a period of time during which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. But legally, a dispensation also refers to an exemption from a set of rules or expectations. So it's a repetition and it's an exception. And Rowlandson's narrative appears to be both. And so throughout the entirety of his preface, 
Here, Amicum has to grapple with the fact that Rowlands' narrative is deeply unusual, having been experienced and penned by a woman. However, its utility, both in providing evidence of the provenance of God and of indigenous savagery, seems to outweigh Rowlands' temporary breach of gender roles. And so in rhetorical drag, Lauren Carroll agrees that these acts of textual mediation, like those that we see in Perry Amicum's preface, were an attempt to control the threatening subjective status of the woman in captivity. And she writes, quote, the rhetorical construction of the female captive as both subject and object of her text is unstable. The long tradition of viewing women's bodies as objects subverts or destabilizes the authority of the captive woman's expression, her voice of experience. That is, her subject position is always threatened by her object position. And thus, while captivity narratives served a valuable ideological purpose in that they could be used as evidence of indigenous inhumanity and therefore justify morally the genocide of native nations, they threatened to deconstruct colonial gender hierarchies of the process. And so remember when uh, Increase Mather claimed, you know, that New England colonies were the sort of recreation of um, heaven on earth. Well, such a reading simultaneously recasts indigenous resistance within a Puritan and historic spiritual telos with indigenous peoples embodying like literally the forces of Satan. And it's this understanding of indigenous peoples that would again then help the Puritans to justify colonization. Um, Rowlandson herself, through the course of her activity, would learn to master the very mode of reading proposed by Increase Mather. So we get this mode of typology in the introduction, in the preface, and then Rowlandson in the body of the text itself proceeds to apply this typological reading to indigenous peoples as well. Puritan colonial expansion posed a serious threat, or sorry, um, so this mode of reading um, that, that Rowlandson deploys and would learn to master, which is again proposed by Increase Mather, um, would be a sort of way to help stabilize the sort of um, threat that her, her female subjectivity posed. So in the opening um, scene of the, the text, there's this raid on Lancaster, which happens before she's taken into captivity. And the way that she describes the raid on Lancaster, she immediately reads indigenous peoples as of course heathens, um, but who embody the sort of physical and spiritual threat, um, but she also animalizes them. Um, and so she says, quote, it was a solemn sight to see so, to, so many Christians lying in their blood, some here and some there here, like a company of sheep torn by wolves. And so again, such language not only animalizes her soon to be captors, but it also figures the Lancaster community within the sort of familiar biblical image of the flock. So Rowlandson invokes biblical verse several times throughout her description of the raid, also most notably citing a passage from the book of Job, wherein raiders attack and steal live cut stock, killing Job's servants, and then leaving only one survivor. And so here, Rowlandson echoes the words of the lone survivor. She says, quote, I, am on, I only am escaped to tell the news. And so again, in all of these sort of references to biblical scripture, Rowlandson thus performs a typological containment of indigenous resistance to colonialism by reading it within the conventions of biblical precedence and thus sort of diffusing the threat her captors pose to her because in the Bible, it all worked out. And therefore, this, this interaction with Indigenous peoples is therefore also predestined to work out. So at one point, also during her captivity, Rowlandson is given a copy of the Bible by her captors and immediately recalls how she returns to the, the text for guidance. And she says, quote, I took the Bible, and in that melancholy time, it came into my mind to read the first 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. I found there mercy was mercy promised again, if we will return to him by repentance and through, though we were scattered from one end of the earth to the other, let the, yet the Lord would gather us together and turn all of those curses upon our enemies. So again, in her typological superimposition of Deuteronomy onto her own experiences, Roland sees her own redemption and return as sort of biblically foretold. Although in the moment she remains scattered and transported from one end of the earth to the other through her series of removes, the guarantee that typology offers Rowlandson uh, allows her to, to diffuse these sort of feelings of terror as God would someday again, you know, turn all of those curses they inflicted upon Rowlandson back onto her captors. So why am I talking about Mary Rowlandson at a slasher conference? 
um, what significance do these phenomena in early colonial captivity narratives have for those of us interested in this, the critical analysis of slasher films? Well, one way we can sort of summarize um, how Rowlandson arrives at her sort of hero survivor status is through these terms. Rowlandson is invited to apprehend and master a colonial form of looking, typology, that affirms white racial supremacy and patriarchy. So, by, and so it's about like white men are in charge of everything, right? So by mastering this sort of typological gaze, Rowlandson was able to claim that she knew that she could escape danger, return to her family safely, and that her indigenous captors would soon sort of face God, God's wrath, right? Rowlandson explains that her salvation comes not from rejecting colonial modes of looking, but by subjecting indigenous peoples to the very same colonial and patriarchal gaze, which places gendered limitations upon Puritan women. And a similar sequence of events occurs within the slasher, wherein the final girl is first objectified by the killer slash monster and the camera only to end the camera. Like, you know, if we're thinking about the gaze and Laura Mulvey and all that stuff. Um, so she's, subject she's objectified by this gaze only to later then master that same objectifying gaze and then use it to find liberation. So again, to go back to Carol Clover, she explains, quote, at the level of the cinematic apparatus, the final girl's unfemininity is signaled clearly by her exercise of an active investigating gaze, normally reserved for males and punished in females when they assume it themselves, tentatively at first and then aggressively. The final girl looks for the killer, even tracking him to his forest hut or his underground labyrinth, and then at him, therewith, and then, you know, kills him, therewith bringing him often for the first time into our, our vision as well. So while the final girl breaks gendered norms through her apprehension of the gaze, this breach is allowed only so long as in exchange, the destruction of the, this destruction of this in, sort of inhuman and, and deeply threatening monster occurs. So it's also critical to note that the final girl frequently operates within a constrained relationship to her sexuality if she's ordered, you know, if she's able to gain access to the gaze. In his essay, quote, proposing a stronger model of feminism and slasher cinema, Kyle Christensen agrees with Carol Clover that the final girl is, quote, not an inherently feminist figure. I think many of us can probably agree with that. Um, and he supports this claim through an analysis of Laurie Strode from John Carpenter's Halloween, who is often sort of extolled as the sort of typical final girl. Um, although Laurie Strode has been championed as a feminist figure, Christensen argues that rather than displaying the qualities of a liberated and agential woman, Laurie is, quote, extremely pure and virginal. She's, quote, very much concerned with about appearing upstanding and moral. She's, quote, submissive. She's domesticated using babysitting, thus surrogate motherhood, as her chief means of disposable income. So all of those are from, from Christensen's essay. So thus, according to Christians and Laurie's ability to fight off the monstrous Michael Myers is a direct result of her alignments with conservative notions of femininity, not despite them. So long as Laurie remains within the confines of a womanhood that is virginal, pure, and domestic, she can experience the narrative agency, which is usually only made available to male characters. This mirrors what we see in a narrative of the restoration of Miss Mary Rowlandson, where an access to a subject forming discourse comes in exchange for strict adherence to religious piety and affirmations of anti-Indigenous rhetoric. So in Rowlandson's narrative, the apprehension of a patriarchally sanctioned form of looking and reading both protects the female from protagonist from overstepping these sort of barriers of propriety, and it contains her acts of witnessing within a sort of colonial acceptable epistemology. So, in both the slasher and the captivity narrative, it's this kind of exchange that takes place that I'm really interested in and, and trying to sort of bring attention to. So the female protagonist is given access to masculine forms of looking and knowing in return for affirming the very modes of looking and knowing, which otherwise constrain her agency. Women are allowed to look and to know so long as they look and know in the way men do. And it's worth pausing to point out the sort of elephant in the room, which is that final girl characters like the protagonists of captivity narratives are almost exclusively white women. And that killers or monsters in both genres are either often sort of racialized peoples 
or people that are associated or beings that are associated with a sort of regressed form of civility or humanity, which sort of codes them racially. So given that the modern slasher and the captivity narrative share many parallels in this sort of like narrative, parallel narrative structure, um, it's time to consider how sort of deeply the colonial residue of the captivity narrative still runs within the slasher genre. So Caribbean scholar Sylvia Winter has critiqued a strain of thinking within Western humanism, which she calls the over-representation over of man, because this strain of sort of Western humanism treats the white, able-bodied, cisgendered, and heterosexual man, quote, as if it were the human. So thereby, um, what happens is that all other forms of being, looking, and thinking are subordinated because they don't re resemble sort of this man, this prototypical man. So both the captivity narrative and the final girl narratives like Halloween contribute to this over-representation of man because they have women characters aspire to master masculine and white supremacist forms of looking. They're saying this is the only way to possibly look. So because of this tendency, these narratives unfortunately rather affirm rather than deconstruct patriarchal and colonial hierarchies, despite the ways that they may sort of upset the conventions of audience identification. So what my reading of slashers alongside the captivity narrative hopes to provoke is a discussion of how both race and gender intersect in the horror narrative. The failure to theorize how the pervasive whiteness of the final girl archetype shapes the political meaning of slashers has produced an incomplete understanding of how whiteness, gender, and racialized difference manifest to shape forms of looking. If debates about feminist critic the feminist critical potential of the final girl are to continue, I think that scholars must seriously consider why it is that the figure's whiteness has not been theorized quite so thoroughly as her femininity. That's it. That's all I got to say. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to, to coming back to you in the Q&A and hearing, hearing some more about this. It's a really fascinating area. Um, we will now move to our second speaker, speaking on the fantasy of whiteness in the slasher, slasher genre. Um, by Michaela Wunsch, who wrote her dissertation in Cultural Studies on the Serial Killer as a Medium of the Unconscious of White Masculinity. She received her PhD from Humboldt University, Berlin, Germany, and teaches Film and Media Studies in the US and Europe, currently at the Alpen Adria University Klagenfurt. Yeah, hi there. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah, I'm glad to be part of this uh, conference and um, I had to cut out, out some pages from my paper so I hope it still makes sense uh, to you, otherwise we have to maybe discuss this. So my paper will focus on the male serial killer Michael Myers who wears a mask in the slash, slasher slash Stalker's film cycle, and I think uh, Vera Dika will uh, say more about this uh, difference. And I will analyze the mask and the look of these figures through the framework of critical whiteness studies and Lacanian psychoanalysis, and ask what Michael Myers could tell us about white masculinity. Following the assumptions of whiteness studies, it is crucial for the position of whites to be unmarked and invisible. The male killer behind the white mask will be weak in analogy of these elements of whiteness, which is the cause of racial signification, but is itself not racially specified. So my dissertation, this book, uh, focused mainly on the first uh, prequel, um, which was then not a prequel, uh, of the popular film cycle Halloween that is best identified by a predominantly off-screen killer. In 1978, Michael Myers appeared on the US American screen for the first time and, thanks to his indestructibleness, has not left it since. Until today, there have been 12 sequels or the latest Halloween Kills will be released 
uh, this October with a one year delay. Um, in part one, the spectator shares the perspective of uh, Laurie, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, who we have just seen, for almost the entire length of the film. But the striking scenes are those in which the camera's and audience perspective is the same as the peeler's point of view. And we also heard something on the point of view. Michael is kept hidden from the audience for almost the entire film. Also, he is present, ah, um, he is only fragmentarily visible. The spectator sees merely the back of his head, the shoulder, or leg, or his mask face. And the face mask was taken from a Captain Kirk mask, and then the hair was cut, and it was painted white. And these are other shots where we only see parts of him. Film theorist Steve Neal interprets this cinematic composition as a refusal to stabilize Michael as an object of the look. In the context of critical whiteness studies, this kind of hiding has been considered as significant for the position of whites in social life and cinematic representation. One of the central assumptions of critical whiteness theorists like Ruth Frankenberg is that whites refuse to acknowledge that they are racialized subjects. Works by so social theorists pronounce that whites ignore the social meaning of whiteness and describe themselves as non-ethnic. Instead, their belonging to the social group of whites is connected with the economic and social privileges. One aspect of the unexamined hegemony of whiteness is to ignore these privileges or rather take them for granted. Whites inhabit the status of an unmarked marker, as Frankenberg writes, and pretend to be universal, colorless, and unmarked by history, while non-whites understood to be particular and culturally determined. Philosopher George Yancey points out that even though the Ku Klux Klan is far from denying their aims, identity, and motivations, one of the functions of whiteness is not to spell out its name. So that in the final analysis, even the notion of innocent whites negates the racist implications of this white identity. Film scholar Richard Dyer follows the assumption and aims of these interpretations and applies them to the field of representation. He notes that while it is often mentioned that a particular film character is black, Asian, or Latin, it is seldom a point of interest if a character is white. At a level of representation, he remarks, whites are not of, to, not of a certain race, they are just the human race. The purpose of naming whiteness as Frankenberg and Dyer try to do is not to recenter or even to re-essentialize whiteness. Instead, it is a strategy to name the meaning race has for whites and the revealing of the unnamed, the exposure of whiteness masquerading as universal. Rather than showing what's beyond the mask of universalism and emptiness, I also intend to demonstrate that not whiteness is nothing but an empty signifier. So let's return to Halloween. Haddonfield, Illinois in 1963, seems to be a place where the idea of whites, whiteness is an invisible norm. This place is a white ghetto and nobody notices it. And um, yeah, about suburbia, John has already said something, and or white suburbia, and I think Miranda will also say something about it. Race doesn't matter in this white's only place. One could analyze it in the words of the German film scholar Eva Ward. White seems to be no color and all colors at once, an empty place and also universal, all but nothing. Maybe this is the cause of its power, end of course. Also, Michael's position, marked as psychic deviant, does not seem to represent the norm. So, my qu last question was, um, so first, did you hear the supposedly innocent child, the sentence? <laughs> okay, my next question was, if, if we can read this uh, mask of um, Michael Myers, as a masquerading of a universality, 
or if it's possible or impossible to read the figure in terms of norm and its other. As Richard Dyer and others have suggested, whiteness, far from being universal, should be understood as a quite fixed set of meanings or properties. Such a reading would, however, reduce the white mask of universality to a representation of a form of false consciousness, beyond which the real content of white identity can be revealed. Departing from this approach, I want to try to analyze the figure and the mask of Michael more in terms of formal signification processes and in terms of looking relations rather than in terms of manifest issues. In the follow, and if you don't hear me say something because I don't see the chat <laughs> right now. Okay. In the following, I will use the framework of Kalpana Sishatri and Lacanian psychoanalysis and try to apply it on an interpretation of Halloween. In her analysis of whiteness, Sishatri points out that, quote, race is fundamentally a regime of looking and visibility. She asks how and why we read certain marks of the body as privileged sites of racial meaning. She asserts that the regime of visibility secures the investment that we make in race by thriving on arbitrary bodily details in order to shore up on symbolic position. She summarizes the definition of whiteness as following. And this is a longer quote. By whiteness, I do not mean a physical or ideological property as it is invoked in whiteness studies or a concept, a set of meanings that functions, functions as a transcendental signified. By whiteness, I refer to a master signifier without a signified that establishes a structure of relations a signifying chain that through a process of inclusions and exclusions constitutes a pattern for organizing human difference. We will therefore see how this symbolic structuration is related to visibility. Like a signifier without a signified, Michael seems to have no proper human properties at all. Neither has a transparent personal motive to kill except, except the compulsion to repeat nor does he, as a psychiatrist, Dr. Loomis asserts, have a specific human character. Michael has no human emotions, no reason, no conscience. Veradika notes this lack of humanity is pronounced by the mask. Michael's face mask, like the mask created by the film frame itself, hides not only the killer's face, but also his humanity. In this way, the killer is abstracted, presented as the perfect embodiment of evil. He functions as the purveyor of an essential truth that these films argue, Dika writes. Michael is not just the purveyor of a principle, but also the very cause, an empty cause of incidents. So I don't agree <clears throat> with Dr. Loomis that Michael cannot differentiate. He does make differences in the sense his sharp claims inhabits a position of a signifier that shapes human difference through inclusions and exclusions. He even emphasizes exclusions in uh, the form of murder or slashing. He shapes the, the differences through the cuts of a knife or an axe. Dika has shown that the stalker film divides the characters of the young community between valued and devalued. The latter must die at the hands of the killer. In fact, Michael marks who is valued or devalued. This selection through cutting not only refers to the film production itself, it can be seen as a form of signification in general. In Lacanian psychoanalysis, the compulsion to repeat that seems to be the only motive of the murders is an important and general aspect of the signifying chain. As reflected in the title of Lacan's famous essay, Repetition is the very agency of the latter in the unconscious. At this point, it is important to bring to mind the often repeated sentence that the unconscious is structured like a language and that vice versa, the symbolic exists in the unconscious. Various authors like for instance, Robin Wood claim that the killer in the slasher or stalker film is an embodiment of the it which in Lacanian psychoanalysis means the unconscious and symbolic origin of being in language, 
the place from where the subject is being spoken and from which Michael himself is being excluded because he's not speaking. Okay, great. Now comes ambulance. The Chardonnay claims that it is whiteness that should be discerned as an unconscious signifier, as a master signifier that enables a regime of visibility through signification but remains out of the system by his lack of language, for instance, and also by his not being the object of any case. I propose that Michael inhabits the position of a master signifier. The starting point of my analysis corresponds to the assumption of whiteness studies that whiteness functions as an unmarked marker. However, in following Sishadri, my approach also departs from this field. It differs from most approaches in whiteness studies that whiteness is understood as a signifier without fixed meaning. Whiteness is positioned both outside of the system that it enables, but at the same time places itself in the very center. The signifier in its awesome and terrifying aspect discloses itself as something inassimilable to the very system that it causes and upholds. Sishadivats. I would say this definition serves as a more useful explanation of Maya's position than the opposition of norm and deviance. Another aspect that speaks for the argument that Michael embodies a kind of whiteness as a master signifier can be found in the relation to sexual difference. Uh, according to Sishatri, race identity can only have one function. It establishes different relations among the races to constitute the logic of domination. Whiteness does not only signify, but promises something. Wholeness and totality, the overcoming of lack and difference, especially the constitutive lack of the sex subject. Lacan and John Kopchak uh, locate sexual difference in the realm of the real. That also means that sexual difference is not representable but brings reason and language to its own limit. Sishadi proposes that whiteness attempts to install itself in the place of linguistic contradiction of being where the subject fades from meaning. Such an attempt to totalize and inflate the subject can only produce anxiety. And this is why this master signifier might be also situated in the horror film genre. The first sequence of Halloween, the voyeuristic look at the kissing couple has been described as a kind of reenactment of the primal scene or voyeuristic trauma the moment a child recognizes sexual difference. Michael's reaction to his discovery of sexual difference is to kill his sister, to flee the limitation that is bound to sexual difference and to install himself in an omnipotent position. And this attempt produces anxiety. This position does not merely include to reinstall difference by killing, but corresponds with an omnipresent and frightening position of looking. According to Lacan, there's only one condition to see the gaze. He writes, painters above all have grasped the, this gaze as such in the mask. It is the mass that demonstrates the functions of the gaze that Kopchak remarks that some meaning is left unrevealed. The mass suggests that there is something beyond, something to be regained. And according to Sishadri, whiteness promises to overcome the lack to regain the self by encountering the gaze. And I quote her again, the fantasy of encountering whiteness would be for the subject of race to recover the missing substance of one's being. It would be to coincide not with a transcendental ideal, some rarefied model of bodily perfection, but with the gaze. The, that void in the other, a piece of the real that could an, annihilate difference. She assumes that whiteness as an object A is, is the thing beyond appearance that promises to gain, regain the wholeness. But beyond the mask, there is not a thing but the evil or blind look, the absence of a signified in Halloween. Whiteness not, now tries to fill the space which must remain empty, 
According to Lacan, anxiety begins where there's something that nothing should be, the lack of a lack. Whiteness tries to overcome the lack and promises a fantasy where difference and lack are wholly extinguished. One sign of this is the immortality of Michael Myers. But to encounter the gaze, to encounter something where it has to be nothing, means not to regain wholeness, but to die. This is because the point of the gaze marks the subject's very annihilation. In other words, words, it is what the subject does not see and not simply what it sees that founds it. To see the organizer of the look, the cause of visibility is an impossibility that is fulfilled in Halloween with lethal results for the lookers. So my conclusion, white masculinity as it figured out by the mass serial killer in the stalker film seems to have no specific racialized properties. Maybe a bit contradictory was Kelly just said. Instead, the killer installs a system of visual differentiation. Myers tries to inhabit an impossible position, that of totality, ubiquity, immortality, and wholeness. Short, that of being without meaning. He embodies the gaze as object A as well as the gaze of the other, or both coincide in his point of view. On the one side, he is beyond the symbolic order or beyond the wall of language. He doesn't even speak. He cannot be integrated in the suburban community of Haddonfield. He escapes intersubjectivity, language, and lethality by installing himself as the organizer of the whole scene. His gaze as object A is nothing but the way the objective neutral view of the entire picture is in the picture itself, to refer to Zizek. The big other, the, this objective neutral view that whiteness as organizer of visibility inhabits, coincides with Michael Myers' evil look behind the mask. The film does not show racial visibility as such, but the structuration that it en enables and the implication of whiteness as its master signifier. So, okay, so I hope I was <laughs> heard. <laughs> yeah, yes. okay. Okay. Yes, definitely. In fact, it was, <clears throat> the quality of the sound was, was better after the the problem, so. Yeah. I'll also um, close the window for the QA. <laughs> oh, great, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your fascinating paper. And it has generated lots of um, really active discussion in the comments, um, which we can hopefully come back to in the Q&A. Um, and for now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker. Um, Dr. Miranda Corcoran is lecturer in 21st century literature at University College Cork, Ireland. She is currently writing a monograph on adolescence and witchcraft in American popular culture. That sounds really cool. Um, and she is also the co-editor with Steve Gronert Ellerhoff on exploring the horror of supernatural fiction, Ray Bradbury's Elliot family. And she'll be speaking on There's a Maniac Loose in the City, Space, Identity and Boundary Crossing in the Urban Slasher. Take Thank it away, you. Miranda. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Um, awkwardly as I narrate what I'm doing. There we go. The worst thing about going last is that I have to follow two absolutely amazing papers. So I'm not relishing that. But anyway, I'll get started. So this paper focuses on three controversial slasher films set in New York City during the late 1970s and the early 1980s. And it argues that each of these films associates violence with the permeable boundaries of the cityscape. Now, I'll probably diverge a little bit from the two previous speakers in that while I will be discussing the phenomenon of white flight quite extensively, I'll probably be leaning more into questions of class. Now, when I describe these films as controversial, I'm mostly referring to the manner in which each of them ran afoul of censorship laws and moral crusades during the so-called video nasties moral panic that took 
hold in Great Britain during the 1980s. So the first film I'm speaking about, Driller Killer, directed by Abel Ferreira, was banned under the Video Recordings Act 1984. The second film I'm talking about, Maniac, directed by William Lustig, was never officially a video nasty. However, it was refused classification in Britain during its initial release, and it was seized by police in a number of locales around the UK. This seems to be more based on its reputation and its uh, pretty gruesome cover art more than its actual content. And then lastly, the final film I'm going to be talking about as part of this presentation is The New York Ripper, which was directed by the Italian giallo pioneer Lucio Fulci, and as a result, I think, exemplifies the often unstable generic distinction between jally and slashers, which was, of course, discussed earlier. And this film is perhaps the most notorious of the three films I'm going to be discussing. When it was first submitted to the British Board of Film Classification, one member of staff described it as simply the most damaging film I have ever seen in my life, and it was banned in the UK until 2002. Now, while these films are interesting in terms of both their popular reception and their nihilistic treatment of violence, as well as the manner in which this led to them falling victim to various censorship crusades, in my presentation, what I really want to focus on is their representation of urban space. All three of these films were produced just as the phenomenon of white flight resulted in a large scale exodus of middle class white Americans from the city of New York, and crucially, just before urban renewal projects led to the redevelopment of notoriously squalid or vice ridden areas like 42nd Street and Times Square. And in analyzing these films, I'm going to draw on Samuel Ordelaney's 1999 study, Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, and his argument that prior to their renovation, New York's seedier neighborhoods served as important cultural loci that promoted contact and communication across the lines of race, class, gender, and sexuality. However, I'm also going to argue that where Delaney views such boundary crossings as pleasurable and productive, many contemporary commentators feared their capacity to destabilize ingrained social hierarchies. And the three films discussed in this paper display, as a result, a profound ambivalence about the fluidity of boundaries within an urban context, appearing simultaneously intrigued by the dynamism of city spaces, the exciting aspects, or the exciting possibilities opened up by boundary crossing, but at the same time, they seem repulsed by their potential for violence and disorder. So during the first wave of American slasher films produced during the late 1970s and early 1980s, terror lurked in typically middle class, overwhelmingly white spaces. Kara M. Kavaran notes that throughout the formative years of the American teen slasher, we can find a repeated trope wherein young people must learn that, quote, summer camps, small towns and suburbs, the very hallmarks of safe middle class America, the world their baby boomer parents created for them was, in fact, not safe at all. These films, Kavaran explains, generally provide viewers with a comfortable, familiar setting, a place that she says should be safe but has been perverted by the killer. The suburbs in particular possess an important symbolic value in, Amer in American culture um, and within the slasher as well. As an icon of post-World War II American affluence, the suburban environment is one that carefully separates out and polices racial, class, sexual, and gender identities. When a killer stalks the suburbs, these boundaries are momentarily threatened, but ultimately reaffirmed as the murderer is dispatched and order is restored. As Sorka Nivialon points out, quote, the ideal white suburban neighborhood consistently survives these narratives despite any invading slasher, end quote. <clears throat> 
So suburban neighborhoods are ubiquitous in the slashers of this period. In films like Halloween and A Nightmare on Elm Street, they are presented as idyllic, albeit, albeit homogenous spaces. Overwhelmingly white and middle class, the placid streets of Haddonfield, Illinois and Springwood, Ohio, are inhabited by a population described by the sociologist Lewis Mumford, who was writing in the 1960s, as, quote, people of the same class, the same income, the same age group, witnessing the same television performances, eating the same tasteless prefabricated foods from the same freezers, conforming in every outward and inward respect to the common mold. When violence comes to these placid neighborhoods, it is usually brought about by the intrusion of some figuration of difference. Nivea Alon argues that while most, if not all, of these slasher villains are white, they are usually avatars of some form of socioeconomic otherness, transient figures with poorly paid jobs or no permanent home. They temporarily bring violence and chaos to the neatly ordered suburban utopia, but their disruptive presence is almost invariably expelled before the final credits roll. Now, this homogeneity does, of course, make sense if we consider the social context of the post-Halloween slasher boom. Erica Villa points out that during the period between the 1940s and the 1970s, quote, suburbanization, a mode of urbanization in which cities extend outward rather than upward to accommodate, accommodate the spatial appetites of homeowners, retailers and industrialists reached a pinnacle. End quote. And at this time, America's suburban population increased from 3.5, sorry, 35.1 million to 75.6 million between 1950 and 1970. First appearing in the late 1940s to provide accessible, affordable homes for returning World War II servicemen and their families, suburban housing developments offered the utopian prospect of a clean quasi-bucolic environment within commuting distance of major cities. Moreover, post-war initiatives such as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, also known as the GI Bill, ensured that former soldiers could secure cheap mortgages and low interest loans on their new homes. However, while such initiatives made home ownership possible for an entire generation of white Americans, Practices such as redlining, restrictive covenants, and municipal incorporation, along with violence and intimidation, ensured that the utopian promise of suburbia did not extend to people of color. Instead, as Avila points out, federally sponsored suburbanization removed an expanding category of white Americans from what deteriorated into inner city reservations of racialized poverty. The ability of white, upwardly mobile Americans to flee urban centers for the fresh air and safety of the suburbs has been termed white flight, which Avila describes or defines as, quote, a structural process by which post-war suburbanization helped the racial resegregation of the United States, dividing presumably white suburbs from concentrations of racialized poverty. Moreover, by the early 1980s, just as the slasher was becoming a highly visible genre, the election of President Ronald Reagan further solidified the divide between impoverished urban centers and affluent suburbs as social infrastructure like Medicaid, uh, sorry, Medicare and Social Security were decimated. So the resegregation of the US and the re-entrenchment of both class and racial divides thus ensure that suburbia was delimited by rigid boundaries whose breach could only signify a calamitous threat to the social order. Any force that threatened or briefly permeated these boundaries was figured as an anomaly whose expurgation would reaffirm the divisions they had momentarily underlined. The proliferation of suburban slashers makes a great deal of sense within this context. The suburbs are homo a homogenous, rigidly stratified space, and it is therefore very easy to frame an intrusive force as disruptive. Conversely, slashers set in urban spaces are comparatively rare. While there are many reasons for this, including the primarily adolescent or young adult demographic of 80s slasher audiences, 
I would argue that the heterogeneity of city spaces ensures that boundary, social boundaries are less clearly delineated and the transgression of such boundaries is a far more mundane occurrence. Geographers England and Simon note that because cities are diverse, often containing radically different communities living in close proximity, boundaries can be challenged and unease can occur. So the three films that I'm going to focus on for the remainder of this paper, Driller Killer, Maniac and The New York Ripper, all portray New York as a heterogeneous space in which different races, class, sorry, in which different race, class, and gender identities interact in scenarios that are framed as alternately productive and threatening. Driller Killer focuses on a young artist named Reno Miller, played by the film's director, Abel Ferreira. Reno lives in a squalid apartment near Union Square, while his accent and appearance code him as working class. Reno, who will soon embark on a killing spree using the eponymous power tool, navigates a social milieu comprised of drug addicts, homeless derelicts, and middle or upper class members of the artistic community. The borders separating these classes appear fluid. A wealthy gallery owner calls, casually calls to Reno's rundown apartment, and two young women described by another character as nice girls and coded as upper class by their well-tailored clothes and expensive shoes sing with the grubby punk band that rehearses in the apartment above Reno's. The narrative is also intercut with documentary style footage shot by Ferreira of the city's homeless population. In one particularly uncomfortable scene, the camera lingers on an intoxicated man falling asleep on the sidewalk as vomit seeps from his half open mouth. In the standard suburban slasher of this period, such scenes of abjection normally only occur after the disruptive presence of the killer has brought violence and disorder to a once placid community. In Ferreira's New York, however, such abject imagery is interwoven into the social fabric of the city. Now, before I move on, I should state that Ferreira's inclusion of footage of New York's homeless population is not necessarily intended to be exploitative, though it could be read as such. Rather, he seems to be interested in highlighting the degradation experienced by the homeless and their vulnerability to violence. And this is rendered explicit in an early scene in the film where Reno sees a newspaper headline that reads, quote, state abandons mentally ill, end quote. And this seems to be an allusion to the rapid process of deinstitutionalization that during the 1960s and 70s saw many individuals released from psychiatric hospitals and returned to the community with little or no support. Like Driller Killer, William Lustig's Maniac portrays New York as a dynamic social arena in which members of the working class, like the perennially filthy serial killer Frank Zito, see here, are free to interact unproblematically with middle and upper class characters, like the elegant photographer Anna, played by Carolyn Monroe, who you can see here in the background. Similarly, Fulci's New York Ripper imagines the titular city as a fluid site where members of the primarily white professional and middle classes regularly interact or regularly encounter both the working classes and other racial groups. Now, according to the science fiction author and literary critic Samuel Orr Delaney, Prior to the radical redevelopment of 42nd Street and Times Square that commenced in 1995 under the mayorship of Rudy Giuliani, the, the porn theaters, peep shows, and sex industries that had defined these locales promoted cross-community contact between individuals of different races and classes. Delaney argues that the rejuvenation of these areas a process sometimes popularly referred to as the Disneyfication of Times Square. He argues that the rejuveni this rejuvenization process served to create the illusion of safety for certain, mostly white middle-class groups who fear the kind of intercommunity contact he describes. In his book, Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, Delaney claims that prior to its redevelopment, Times Square was dominated by the poor and working class, who regularly interacted with middle and upper class individuals who often traveled there for the specific purposes of engaging in often sexual interclass contact. 
For Delaney, this is a dynamic process. Drawing on his own experiences of visiting gay porn theaters in the 1970s and 80s, Delaney maintains, quote, life is at its most rewarding, productive, and pleasant when large numbers of people understand, appreciate, and seek out interclass contact and communication in a mode of goodwill, unquote. However, he also notes that, quote, the class war raging constantly and often silently perpetually works for the erosion of the social practices through which interclass communication takes place. Thus, for Delaney, intergroup contact is dynamic, productive, and desirable. However, while Delaney frames this kind of contact as enriching and pleasurable, many contemporary observers view the breakdown of social barriers with trepidation. The New York described by Delaney was in many ways made possible by a fiscal crisis that reached its peak during the 1970s. Alongside a nationwide recession that began in 1973, New York suffered immensely as a result of white flight. As white middle-class New Yorkers abandoned the city for suburban developments, the number of tax-paying businesses and households decreased, leaving the city unable to pay for operating expenses, including waste disposal, hospitals, and adequate policing and fire services. During these years, as crime rates peaked, visitors to New York airports were provided with a pamphlet entitled Fear City, a survival guide for visitors to New York City. The pamphlet, which was created and distributed by the Council for Public Safety, cautioned against, and by implication attributed the city's violence to, the forms of intercommunity contact endorsed by Delaney. The pamphlet warns readers to confine their movements to the more affluent, overwhelmingly white area of Midtown, and to avoid the Bronx in particular. The three films I'm discussing here are deeply ambivalent in their treatment of interclass contact vacillating between Delaney's celebratory vision and a more paranoid view of ubiquitous violence brought about through the same mode of interclass contact. Driller Killer initially presents cross-class interaction as dynamic and generative, artistically productive. The film grounds itself in the punk subculture of 1970s New York, opening with a title card that reads, this film should be played loud. Later, one of the characters visits the famous music venue, Max's Car uh, Kansas City. Reno, who, as I mentioned earlier, is very much coded as working class, is portrayed as having the opportunity for upward mobility via his connections with the New York art scene. He also spends time sketching and talking with the homeless population of Union Square. At the same time, Driller Killer presents New York's fluid social boundaries as dangerous. In contrast to the sur suburban slasher, violence does not arrive with the sudden appearance of a knife-wielding maniac. It is presented as an ongoing feature of urban life. An early scene which predates Reno's killing spree shows his roommate reading newspaper items about shocking violent crimes. So Reno's violence is thus portrayed as merely one facet of a chaotic urban space. When Reno eventually snaps as a result of his neighbor's loud music, which living in an apartment building, I kind of get, uh, when he eventually snaps, his violence is indiscriminate. He preys on home, the homeless men he had previously befriended and on an upper class art dealer who insulted his latest painting. In these sequences, interclass contact becomes a source of violence and danger. Similarly, in Maniac, Frank's interclass friendship with the elegant photographer Anna is presented, at least initially, as a genuinely meaning relation, meaningful relationship and a possible source of redemption for an otherwise despicable killer. Again, the, so, the permeable social boundaries that facilitate both Frank and Anna's movement across class lines ultimately become a source of danger, as Frank uses his proximity to Anna to stalk the models she works with. A long, tense sequence in which a young nurse dressed in an immaculately white, clean white uniform is hunted by Frank through a filthy graffiti covered subway likewise suggests that points of intersection between the middle and lower classes can be conceived as threatening spaces. As England and Simon note, quote, looking at aspects such as gendered, aged and sexualized geographies of fear 
urban researchers have noted that fear of the city is often related to discourses surrounding those who are seen as different in social contexts, end quote. In this scenario, the nurse's difference, her cleanliness and professional status, is starkly juxtaposed against the dirt and dereliction of the subway and its nighttime denizens. An analogous sequence takes place in the New York Ripper, when a well-groomed, fashionably dressed young woman is attacked on the subway. As in Maniac, the girl's cleanliness, accentuated by her pale skin and blonde hair, presents a mode of overt physical difference when framed against the filthy train carriage. Again, as in the other films discussed in this paper, there is an ambivalence associated with interclass contact. While a number of scenes in this film in view locales like the notorious 42nd Street with an intense, almost palpable paranoia achieved through menacing POV driving shots, other sequences, in contrast, present these spaces as dynamic and exciting. For example, in one early scene, a well-dressed woman attends a live sex show. She is visibly distinguished from the rest of the audience, both by her gender, everyone else is male, and her neat, carefully tailored experience, or sorry, appearance. Yet despite her visible difference, she takes pleasure in the performance and enjoys her immersion in this ordinarily lower class milieu. These examples ultimately bring us back to where we started. It is impossible to definitively identify either a progressive or a reactionary attitude to interclass contact in these films. They are fundamentally ambivalent, representing urban space as both the site of meaningful, productive cross-group interactions and dangerously transgressive acts of boundary crossing. They are also com more complex and ultimately more nihilistic than suburban slashers of the same period. Where the suburban slasher might portray violence and disorder as the result of a temporary act of boundary crossing, in their urban analogues, the killer's brutality is framed as simply part of a much broader ongoing pattern of violence. In these films, the boundaries that separate distinct social groups cannot be reaffirmed because they were presented as permeable from the outset. Ultimately, this may explain why films like Driller Killer, Maniac, and The New York Ripper proved so controversial. While The New York Ripper is an unflinchingly sadistic film, neither Driller Killer nor Maniac is significantly more violent than a standard teen slasher like Friday the 13th. However, unlike the suburban teen slashers of the period, they do not provide a closing reassurance that the social boundaries protecting middle-class security and separation will be re-established. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. So we will now um, hold a Q&A. There has been lots and lots of really lively and fascinating discussion going on in the comments. So I'll, I'll do my best to try to, to, to separate what seem to be uh, just sort of comments on the fly from kind of questions, but sometimes it's it's a little bit difficult to tell the difference. Um, and there was even like a tangent into the Batman series um, and the extent to which that is, um, in, you know, the representation of Gotham um, is inspired by the the era from, from the, the the area you're talking about, Miranda. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that as a kind of, huh, that's interesting. Um, so I'm going to pick out one of the first questions that cropped up, uh, which is directed at Kaylee. Um, apologies, I didn't note down who, who asked this question. But the question is, considering that gender and gender expression is a social construct, what should a feminist final girl look like in terms of encapsulating a non-male personality type slash trait? Yeah, I mean, for me, the concern isn't so much non-male, it's like non-colonial, right? So like the example that I always go back to um, is like Ripley from Alien. Like we all celebrate Ripley because she's this woman, she doesn't take any shit. Like, as a youth, I like sort of was like, whoa, this is so cool and revolutionary. But as I became older and sort of started thinking more about my indigeneity, right, I 
realize that it, there's a really troubling choice that occurs in that movie because I also identify with the xenomorph because the xenomorph is an indigenous woman protecting her land from colonialism, right? Um, and so for me, it's the final girl is this really interesting sort of figure because it emerge, you know, emerges for Clover as this like, you know, potentially liberatory subject where it's like women get all of this agency. But the reality of it is, is that white women get a certain sort of agency in exchange for perpetuating the dispossession of indigenous peoples. And I think this sort of, I, I was sort of thinking about this too um, during Miranda's discussion um, about, you know, say, I love Sam Delaney, Sam Delaney's great. Um, but when Sam Delaney writes about, you know, the sort of queer, black queer sort of freedom within the space of the pornography theater in New York City, what that freedom requires is the dispossession of the Lenape people because you have to take the land from the Lenape people in order to build that theater. And so, you know, it's a sort of roundabout thing, a way of saying, and I think what I'm trying to get at in my presentation is that the sort of, the politics of representation of sort of plugging, say like, uh, they're in the questions, there were you know, a discussion of like Fear, Fear Street, which I've seen part of the first one, um, you know, the, the problem with just sort of plugging, say like a brown or a black woman's body into that system is that it's still ultimately on this trajectory of assimilating that sort of, that body into like a sort of colonial epistemology. And so it's the process of like, we can extend humanity to black and brown women, black and brown queer women, so long as they participate in all of this other gross colonial stuff, right? And so in terms of what would a sort of a final girl narrative that didn't, didn't do all that stuff, what would that look like? Um, I mean, in terms of the, the relationship to the monster, it would be entirely different. Um, you know, in indigenous epistemologies, there's not other be beings that aren't human aren't scary because they aren't human. Like human beings are, we're like the youngest things and, and we're like silly and dumb and like, and we're not that important. Um, and so something's not frightening because it's not human. And so that would have to be a sort of fundamental as fundamental sort of epistemological assumption that informed the rest of the narrative. Um, I think something that gets close to it um, or that gets close to like questioning some of these. Um, Stephen Graham Jones has a new book called um, My Heart is a Chainsaw that's coming out. Um, it has a native final girl um, and most of the, the text is sort of trying to make sense of all the ways that indigenous women have been sort of imagined outside of the, the frameworks of the final girl. Um, so I think that sort of gets at similar questions that I'm getting at. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's again this problem, it's this, the overrepresentation of man, that man can be extended to bodies which are non-white, non-male, so long as all of the other epistemological assumptions that are associated with that are, are upheld. So. Um, I'm just, just still kind of reeling a little bit from your observation about um, alien and, and the xen xenomorph being um, you know, read as indigenous, which makes complete sense. And now I'll, I'll think of that in a whole new light. Um, and I, and as, as you were suggesting, just kind of there in, in your, in your answer, there's also lots of really productive links between your paper and, and the other papers here. And in particular, there was a comment drawing links between your paper um, and the idea of the theorization of whiteness uh, and what Miranda was talking about in relation to the white flights and and creation to the suburb. So I'll use that to segue into um, a question for Miranda from the chat. The question is, with the blending of lower and upper class people taking part in transgressive acts, do urban slashes suggest that in mass, anonymity presents opportunity for cross-cased cohesion in areas? That's a really interesting question. And actually, yeah, I mean, I was kind of, thinking about, you know, some of these points about the theorization of whiteness while I was going through my paper. And one thing that really struck me was Avila's point when he's defining um, white flight about how white flight helped to facilitate the movement of an expanding category of white Americans to the suburb, because in that movement to the suburbs, 
you are expanding the category of what it mean what it means to be white, which is in itself a sort of you know unstable category. So you're bringing new groups who are defined by white via their capacity or defined as white by their capacity to move to these suburban areas into the the broader category of white. So I thought that was really really interesting, and I do think that yeah, in a lot of in these texts, um, particularly in something like Driller Killer there is this sense that in the sort of the somewhat anonymous mass of the city that there is this opportunity for cross-group cohesion and interaction that produces something productive because the film focuses quite heavily on New York's artistic scene from the 19, in the 1970s, so on the punk movement and on the visual arts as well. And sort of like everything else in the film, it's a little bit ambivalent, whereby on the one hand, it definitely represents a sort of generative environment in which this dynamic melding of different groups creates um, an exciting, you know, artistically productive environment. But on the other hand, it also kind of shows how certain individuals are exploited as part of that, how I think success or progression within the artistic movement is easier for people all the you know higher class for example and you know uh people from lower class backgrounds who might be trying to work within that field are sort of more likely to be blocked or more likely to be exploited so again it's, it's sort of ambivalent and it's sort of constantly shifting like a lot of what's happening in these films but yeah i think there's there's definitely that suggestion Great. Um, I'm going to throw a question at Michaela now. Um, there was lots of really lively discussion going on in the chat while you were speaking about um, when he does, when Michael does wear a mask and when he doesn't wear a mask and kind of what, what that means at different times. So one of the specific questions that came up was, could it be argued that the shape has more humanity without the mask, therefore reforming to the man? Michael Myers. Would you also put it in the written thing? Of course. Um, I, I mean, I'll try to. I'll put it always like wears the mask. I mean, I concentrate on the first part. Um, I just put put it into the private chat for you. Ah, okay. Um, I mean, but then I also found some shots where even the mask has some humanity or implies some humanity. For instance, in the recent sequels, the mask ages. <laughs> it's not the mask of the, I mean, of course, a mask wouldn't age, but Michael Myers' mask ages. It uh, gets older with the sequels. So I would say there, so I think my general thesis is still okay, <laughs> that with the mask, there is this lack of humanity and also this lack of mortality and the lack of speech uh, and so on. But if one could really watch it, watches is in details or in shots. There are some, it's not the, only the mask, but some gestures that makes him like a tiny bit human. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, the later sequels maybe gives him the humanity in this aging process. <laughs> you can see in the mask, yeah. There was also a, a comment in the, the chat about the implications of the work overalls that Michael wears in the Halloween films. Like, yeah. does this imply, like, that he's a, a member of the proletariat? And I think that that, you know, possibly has some links with what Kaylee was saying about um, how the kind of quote-unquote villains in the captivity narratives have a tendency to be um, indigenous and, and racialized others. Yeah, I thought about this too. It has a blue collar um, implication. This, on the one side. On the other side, if you uh, read it in terms of um, 
male uniformity or uniforms in general, like military, police, and so on and so forth. It also has like something of this male masquerade, masquerading itself as like nothing. Not like in contrary to the female masquerade, which is like uh, make yourself pretty. Male masquerading is like make yourself more or less invisible. I think his uh, blue, this blue uh, collar suit has more to do with his invisibility than with his uh, class. Because as we've seen in the first movie, he is from this middle class suburban home. He doesn't have, a, really doesn't have a, a working class background. He has a middle class background. But of course he was in the uh, hospitalized for a long time and so on. So this makes him not really a member anymore of the middle class. But my thesis is somehow that he is like the external internal of this white suburban class, like the evil part, the master signifying part, maybe also like the working class part that has been excluded to be part of this suburban community. So even maybe people are, have working class income, they still pretend to be uh, middle class. Excellent. Um, there are a few questions for Miranda here, so I'm going to um, pick one at random. Um, somebody asks if you have any thoughts on how the class divide has shifted somewhat from geographical divisions to other factors like economic stability and they mention films like Spree as well as in general the idea of the gig economy work as as relating to this. So I haven't seen Spree but I'm, I'll add it to my ever-expanding list of things to watch but um, I think that's a really really interesting point because I think that makes those very boundaries that I've been talking about almost more unstable in a broader sense because it's very hard to delineate class now based on things like geographical location, because as you said, so many people are working in precarious or gig economy situations where it's potentially, firstly, I suppose more pervasive, but also kind of difficult to identify or um, articulate someone's class based on where they live or what they're presently doing. And I feel like this is something that a lot of academics can probably, um, can probably empathize with because you're, you know, a lot of, especially younger academics are in a situation where they might be working on, you know, fixed term or part-time contracts. And therefore they may be presenting the appearance of being, you know, middle-class when in reality they might be earning hourly wages or they might be in a situation where their employment isn't secure. So therefore how, you know, how do we define them then if they're presenting the appearance of, of middle class, but actually in a very insecure and financially unstable position? So I think it actually, you know, as much as these films present the, you know, the crossing of class boundaries in New York in the 70s and 80s as unsettling in some ways, I think our current situation is even more unsettling because there isn't that, it's not as overt it's just much more omnipresent and that insecurity is much more pervasive and insidious um so yeah i'm definitely gonna have to check out spree because i I'm, the more i think about it the more i'm i'm feeling that our current sort of uh reliance on the gig economy is sort of a horror in itself and would probably make a very good horror movie really interesting stuff um we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to pick out a question that that I that hopefully um, might relate to everyone's papers. Now, this one was asked specifically in relation to Kaylee's paper, but it's kind of about theorizing whiteness more more generally. Um, and they asked what it would look like to theorize whiteness, and in particular how that might help us to think about something like the Karen moment that we have. Um, Kaylee, do you want to make, maybe start us off on that? Yeah, I mean, ho hopefully my 
paper is sort of a, a performance of theorizing whiteness from a sort of indigenous studies perspective. Um, because I think as, uh, as Michaela's you know, presentation pointed out, whiteness wants to imagine, like in, in Richard Wiredwars, you know, whiteness <laughs> wants to imagine itself as nothing. Um, and so that's why I sort of turn to um, Sylvia Winters to think about the ways that um, whiteness aligns itself with the human um, and sort of universalizes one particular perspective, um, which is a sort of white masculine perspective and says, this is the one way of looking at the world. This is the one way of functioning in the world. Um, and I think for me, um, part of sort of the bringing attention to the sort of invisibility of whiteness um, within final girl studies is to sort of go back to um, like the sort of reliance on psychoanalytic analytic theory, because that sort of was Freud's mistake is Freud like interviewed a bunch of white people and was like, ah, this is how everyone's brain must work is how all these white people's brains work. Um, and that's absolutely not true. And that's that exact sort of move to overrepresent man as the sort of one partial um, perspective. Um, and so, yeah, I think, th you know, things that help me theorize this are, um, are thinking about, um, you know, black and indigenous perspectives on looking and thinking about how those epistemologies produce very different relationships to the screen. Um, so if people want things that have helped me think about this um, are definitely Sadia Hartman's scenes of subjection, um, Bell Hooks's work on black looks. Um, you know, I think uh, I always go back to Jody Bird's work because in um, Miranda, in your presentation, the a term that came up was, um, you know, the, the reservationism sort of alluding to gentrification or alluding to ghettoization as reservationism and Jody Bird sort of in her book um, thinks about the ways that, um, you know, the dispossession of indigenous peoples produces a sort of prototype for subsequent dispossession of other people. And so when that came up, I was like, yes, this is exactly what's happening. Um, so those are things that, that helped me sort of theorize this and to think about, you know, what is, in what moments is um, sort of whiteness presenting itself as this universal when it's actually sort of partial, like, his, like situated history that's coming from a particular perspective. Great. Um, well, we, we've basically run out of time now, but um, they were really good questions, really good papers. So thank you very much to everyone involved.